Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Greg Wilpert in Baltimore. Not since the pre-World War II period of the early 20th century have there been as many far-right governments in office as today. It almost seems that with every new election, another one joins the ranks of governments that can be described as authoritarian, anti-immigrant, xenophobic, homophobic, racist, or even sexist. Governments that fall into this far-right categorization include Jair Bolsonaro's government in Brazil, Rodrigo Duterte's in Philippines, Narendra Modi's of India, Tayyip Erdogan's of Turkey, Viktor Orban's of Hungary, Benjamin Netanyahu of uh, Israel, and last but not least, Donald Trump's government in the United States. They all came into power in the last five years, more or less. Why is it, though, that there is this fairly sudden rise of the far right? There are a number of political scientists and sociologists who have tried to explain this phenomenon, but it re receives relatively little attention in the general public. Joining me now to discuss the global rise of the far right is Walton Bello. He is a sociologist who has given this topic a lot of attention. He actually recently published a book on this topic with the title, Counter-Revolution, The Global Rise of the Far Right. He is a visiting professor of sociology at the State University of New York, Binghamton, and joins us today from Bangkok, Thailand. Thanks for being here today, Walden. Oh, thanks for inviting me, Greg. Really happy to be here. So your book is, uh, for the most part, a series of case studies where each chapter covers a different country. And uh, just for our viewers, uh, the countries are Italy, Indonesia, Chile, Thailand, India, the Philippines, the North, by which you mean mostly Europe and Brazil. And um, before we look into these countries and the rise to power in each one of them, um, and we don't have time to go into detail in each one of them, but, uh, but before we dig into a little bit deeper into the causes, I want to address how you identify these governments. That is, you specify that you're looking at counter-revolutionary regimes, uh, which you distinguish from co conservative and reactionary regimes. Now, first of all, I just want to know, what's the difference between these types, conservative, reactionary, counter-revolutionary, and why did you decide to zero in on the counter-revolutionary? Well, um, let me just say that I'm, um, you know, following the categorization of a really great um, historian, Arno Mayer, uh, when he describes, you know, this various phenomena or movements as reactionary. Uh, basically, it is, you know, um, a, a movement that wants to go back to the past, to a past kind of regime. Uh, conservative, uh, uh, and that is, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, a regime that uh, basically wants uh, the status quo, doesn't necessarily worship the past as reactionaries do. And a counter-revolutionary, uh, that is the most interesting and the most dangerous because there is a mass base, uh, whereas the reactionary and conservative um, regimes uh, generally tend to appeal mainly to the elites. Uh, the counter-revolutionary uh, regimes um, and counter-revolutionary movements are very heated kind of movements, and they do have a mass base. Oftentimes, it is a multi-class base, but in many, many cases, the axis or the engine of uh, a counter-revolution is, is the middle class. Uh, and um, so that I thought was, um, that categorization I think was much more useful in terms of understanding right-wing movements, um, you know, rather than the usual um, uh, categories of just calling them dictatorships or authoritarian uh, regimes or populist regimes. There's a lot of um, studies that, you know, uh, call writing your regimes at this point populist regimes. And basically it's not very, very helpful because populism is more of a political style, um, you know, a, a sort of a direct appeal to the people. And populism really does, as, as a term, doesn't really um, give you a sense of the content uh, of the programs uh, of these regimes or these movements. And, and so that is why I felt, you know, that um, uh, counter-revolution 
and counter-revolutionary movements, uh, you know, was was you know a better term in terms of capturing the essence of these movements. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you already mentioned one aspect of that, of how they came to power in the sense, I mean, it, it seems to me that uh, if, they have a, if they have a mass base that's directly associated also with the fact that they take place or they come to power in the context of a liberal representative democracy. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm wondering what other kinds of commonalities would you say bring these counter-revolutionary regimes to power? I mean, it seems to me that you distinguish two different kinds. One is kind of political causes, that is the failure of liberal democracy, uh, and on the other hand, kind of economic causes, the failure of neoliberalism. So can you mm -hmm. just uh, distinguish between those and what kinds of countries would follow in, uh, into those different categories? I use the word counter-revolution to, as you say, describe uh, two kinds of phenomena. Uh, one is the counter-revolution that is a response to a lower class insurgency. Uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, an effort by the left, whether by reformist means or by revolutionary means, uh, uh, to come to power. And then there is a reaction from threatened classes. And these threatened classes, uh, of course, there are the elites, the capitalist elites, uh, and usually the landed classes. Um, but um, there is also um, a strong middle class base to them, uh, you know, that feels threatened by the rise of the uh, um, lower classes. And then there is, as you mentioned, the counter-revolution that is uh, a kind of a totalistic um, uh, response to the crisis of liberal democracy. And um, this is a response to uh, a failure at the economic level, um, uh, a failure at the political level, uh, and uh, a failure at the ideological level. Uh, so it's, it's what you might say a multidimensional response to uh, the crisis of liberal democracy as, you know, uh, not having been able to deliver uh, on its promises. Uh, and so, so, you know, we see this very clearly, for instance, in the Global South, in the case of India uh, with Narendra Modi and the uh, Hindu nationalist movements that he now um, uh, is he represents, which is a very very strong reaction to the secular um, uh, democracy uh, that uh, was championed diversity, um, uh, uh, that was you know associated with the Congress Party with Gandhi um, and with Nehru, uh, and you also see that in the case of the Philippines, where um, after 30 years of a liberal democracy that um, was not um, able to deliver on the promise of empowerment and equality. Um, you know, there was this middle class that surged um, uh, to um, uh, an authoritarian uh, figure who in many ways challenges almost every aspect of liberal democracy, whether it's due process, you know, uh, and uh, whether it it, it it has to do with the the language the the of, of liberal democracy uh, and 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 the promises of democratization and a worship of authoritarianism and a strong man rule uh, uh, in the case of a person like like Duterte so so those are the two kinds of counter-revolutionary phenomena that I look at one is as in Chile as in Thailand at this point, uh, a response to a lower class insurgency. And the second one is a kind of a totalistic response to the crisis of liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. You can add so many different examples, and I think it's sure. very interesting to look at this. Um, for example, the Indonesian case is also particularly extreme, and we're not, you're not just talking about contemporary, uh, I mean, your book focuses also on some 
past examples, such as sure. Italy and uh, Indonesia, where uh, sure. these were also reactions to uh, the failures, I guess, of, of liberal democracy sure. or of uh, the encroachment of, or the fears that the upper class seems to have of, um, of liberal democracy and, sure. and ref uh, reforms that were taking place mm -hmm. or threatening to take place. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's that's a very interesting point. Now, uh, one of the other points that you make that is very interesting is that you identify two different kinds of um, class alliances or backgrounds to the far right. That is one case, you know, and I guess it correspond kind of towards the types of reactions that are, or circumstances, you know. Uh, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about that, because I think it's very interesting that uh, in that oftentimes the middle classes, you know, plays a very important role. And that's something that perhaps uh, uh, Western analysts oftentimes don't pay attention to, at least when when uh, you talk about these kind of the rise of the global right, it's often presented in the context of, you know, oh, you know, the, 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 the working class uh, being responsible for it. But you really place the onus really much more on the middle class for the rise of the right. Yeah, well, um, you know, let me put it this way. The great understudied class in political science or in sociology is the middle class. Um, uh, oftentimes, the focus of studies uh, is on the elites, you know, whether the landed elites or the capitalist elite, uh, and on uh, the working class, uh, because those are supposed to be the two polar classes in a capitalist society. And the middle class uh, was long regarded uh, in as mainly as responding to the, um, the you know, to, to the, to the, to the, to these two classes. Uh, a sort of, uh, you know, a class or a stratum that was that could be pulled either way to the left uh, or to the right. And so uh, uh, in, 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 in a lot of, um, you know, the strategies of the left, um, you know, the middle class was seen as this sort of a passive agent that, you know, as long as you just had a program that would satisfy their material desires, um, they would come over to the left. And this was a kind of, um, you know, this was the kind of united front kind of politics that characterized the left in so many countries, um, you know, um, you know, until until the recent times. But the, the fact, though, is that, you know, the middle class um, has an agency of its own. Uh, and once um, the middle class begins to um, uh, have this agency uh, because it feels that its structural position uh, is very much threatened, then it becomes, um, you know, a, a very strong force uh, in a counter-revolutionary coalition. Uh, and, um, and, and I think uh, what we've seen, for instance, in the case of Chile, uh, and in many other cases, um, uh, is 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 in fact that that you have this mass base that um, has a dynamic of its own. Uh, yes, as in Italy and Germany, it 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 has alliances with the elites, but not really controlled by the elites. Uh, in fact, it it pushes uh, very hard uh, on on its own. Um, you know, so, it, you know, you have this very interesting class dynamics and we cannot just reduce, therefore, the middle class uh, to a simple passive instrument in the hands of the elites or in the hands of, say, you know, working class uh, political parties. Uh, uh, it, it has an agency of its own. And I think that the lack of appreciation of the fact that the middle class has an agency of its own, has been responsible uh, for many of the political mistakes, uh, you know, that uh, that progressive movements um, have uh, have have um, you know committed. Now, when you come to the global north at this point in time, definitely, I, I would say that uh, it is threatened middle classes that are. Uh, um, the the center of this writing right wing movements at this point in time, uh, but uh, what I think has happened is that many of these right wing movements, led by middle class personalities uh, and sometimes by elite personalities, uh, one of the characteristics, of course, 
uh, at this point in the north is that they've been able to win over uh, the base that was traditionally the base of the um, um, progressive parties in, 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 in the, the traditional working classes. And I think, uh, uh, you know, the reason for this, of course, um, is uh, several things. Um, and as you can see in the book, when I deal with the North, uh, one of it is that the working class parties in Europe and the Democratic Party in the United States basically um, espoused uh, uh, neoliberal programs, um, were won over, were won over to neoliberalism, and this had a major impact on the lives uh, and the incomes uh, and the economic status of the working class. Um, uh, and we also uh, saw that uh, in the case of the European Union, for instance, mm. and its the democratic deficit, uh, the right uh, was also able to use that. And then, of course, there was the whole issue of migration. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, the, the, the right wing uh, was able to use this issue of migration uh, in, in, a, in a way, you know, that, um, that has been quite clever in basically saying that, hey, um, we'll keep the welfare state, um, uh, but uh, only for the traditional ethnic stock in okay. this country. That's sort of, you know, the, the kind of uh, um, similarities and, and differences between mm -hmm. this counter-revolutionary movements in the global north and the global south. I think that's a very interesting point that speaks to the strategies. Um, and I want to get, dig into that uh, more in part two. So uh, we're going to conclude sure. this first part. Uh, this concludes the first part of my conversation with Walden Bello on his book, Counter Revolution, The Global Rise of the Far Right. Uh, please join us for part two, where we continue to develve deeper into the topic. Hey, everyone. My name is Arud Sheikh, and I'm the development campaign manager at the Real News Network. If we're gonna stand up to the corporate elites, then we need your help to make people powered media. And that's why I'm asking you to please donate to The Real News Network. And while you're at it, hit the subscribe button. Thanks so much.